Hey all, this is Pastor Joshua Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas. Welcome back to another episode of ATP Ask the Pastor. Today's question deals with the history of Lutheranism, specifically what uh, we often call the age of Lutheran Orthodoxy. Someone writes in, Pastor, I stumbled across your YouTube channel. Great stuff. Thank you for taking the time to make videos. I just finished reading Lives and Writings of the Great Fathers of the Lutheran Church, published by CPH. It has introduced me to a part of Lutheran history that I'm not fully familiar with, and that is Lutheran scholasticism and Lutheran orthodoxy. Could you tell me more about this Lutheran school of thought and the period of Lutheran orthodoxy? What exactly is Lutheran scholasticism? Who's its leading figure? Uh, what are the pros and cons of Lutheran scholasticism? If you have time, which Lutheran or Lutherans would you recommend studying more from this long list found in the book? Uh, I'm familiar with Johann Gerhard and enjoy his works, but I'm not familiar with the other Lutherans listed. I read their short biographies. Uh, what are your thoughts on Paul Gerhardt or Abraham Kalov? And then he provides a list, holy moly, a long list of Lutheran theologians from the age of Orthodoxy, uh, some of whom include Egidius Hunius, uh, oh, let's see, Solomon Glassius, uh, Balthazar Meissner, etc., etc., etc. Okay, yeah, we can do that. We can make some recommendations at the end of this. Um, so, yeah, when he asks about the age of Orthodoxy, as far as uh, time period is concerned, age of Orthodoxy really begins in 1580 with the publication of the Christian Book of Concord. Uh, what's the Book of Concord uh, is, is put together. That, uh, that consists of the three ecumenical creeds of the Church, the Augsburg Confession and its Apology. Uh, let's see, uh, the small called articles written by Dr. Luther and its appendix uh, on the power and primacy of the Pope by Melanchthon. Uh, then you've also got Luther's large and small catechisms. And finally, you've got the formula of Concord in its entirety. Uh, they're in the Book of Concord. And that publication of that really marks the beginning of this age. And it lasts... I think I've heard people stretch it out to as far as 1713. So uh, that's, the, that's the time period. And a lot happens politically during that time. You have the Thirty Years' War during that time from about 1618 to 1648 think. Uh, you've got a lot politically happening in Europe. Um, so th it's just a real tumultuous time for the church and for the world then. So uh, the Age of Orthodoxy is really I think, I think the one thing that everyone can agree on is the age of orthodoxy is really marked by those theologians' desire for faithfulness to the Word of God and to, the, and to precision in the way that they present the doctrine of the Scripture then. Now, this has led some people, and, and in fact, uh, this is the, 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 the majority view of the age of orthodoxy. Uh, the majority of view is that it's dead orthodoxy, meaning that... Um, the pejorative view of this is that uh, these theologians were so uh, academic in their mindset and so um, scholastic in their methodology, we'll get to that in a moment, that uh, there was really no feeling or faith to it at all. And that really the hallmark of this age was this doctrinal precision at the cost of everything else. Now, uh, that is beginning, that, that, that more pejorative view of the age of orthodoxy is starting to crack under its own weight, and you're seeing more people get, uh, get familiar with the age of orthodoxy. That's why I was uh, interested to see this book by CPH. I looked it up and uh, read some of the portions on, online uh, that CPH allowed, and uh, you know, for the most part, it was pretty informative. Uh, you know, there was a you know, glaring misconception about Egidius Hunius, uh, and his dealings with predestination and Samuel Huber, uh, but you know that's a different ATP. So, uh, age of orthodoxy is really about this doctrinal precision. And now you write about uh, that as opposed to or alongside of Lutheran scholasticism. Lutheran scholasticism, uh, generally speaking, when somebody calls this age the uh, you know Lutheran scholastic age, generally they're using that as a pejorative term. Uh, scholasticism as a theology and as a methodology really came into vogue during the Middle Ages. Luther matriculated in the scholastic schools. And um, the scholastic schools, their methodology was to use Aristotelian categories. So you had Aristotle's four causes, you had uh, a lot of syllogisms, and uh, during the Medieval Ages what um, the, the Roman scholastics did was they, they valued the philosophy aspect of it 
over the scriptural aspect of it. And that's something that, that Luther attacks uh, a lot in his early writings. Uh, and then, you know, he, he never really stops attacking scholasticism throughout his life, but he really gives it uh, its hardest blows uh, there at the beginning of his Reformation. But, uh, so, so yeah, so generally when we say Lutheran scholasticism, generally it's a pejorative term. Again, to get at that idea of its dead orthodoxy, it's not producing anything that's, that's worth our time or that can help us in the faith uh, or with a Christian life, that sort of thing. The idea that uh, orthodoxy was purely scholastic or it was dead then is kind of what leads to the age of pietism immediately following that. Uh, a lot of folks were thinking that, um, that the age of orthodoxy, that Lutheran theologians were, were too precise uh, and uh, too much about dogma and doctrine, and that had cost them too much, especially in the Thirty Years' War. And so you begin to see more pietistic thought come out of that, where uh, you know, doctrine isn't important as much as uh, what you feel in your heart then. Now, this is very comparable to what we see in North America right now because uh, the folks that focus on you know, doctrinal precision and, and getting the Word of God and our doctrine right, our confession of faith about the Word of God correct, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you see those folks marginalized uh, because the majority of American Christianity it comes out of pietism. Uh, in North America, it was actually revivalism that a lot of it comes out of. But so th there's a good, uh, th that time period of the age of orthodoxy and then into pietism is really analogous to our own time uh, to a certain extent now. Uh, so that's why we generally don't like to call it Lutheran scholasticism because it wasn't scholastic in its theology uh, and it did allow for scholastic methodology like we said with Aristotle's four causes, uh, a use of syllogisms, etc. But uh, especially guys like Johann Gerhardt that you mentioned in his Lochi, he really uses those in service of the word uh, for the sake of that precision, uh, not uh, in, in a cumbersome way. Uh, that the medieval scholastics had done. So don't call it Lutheran scholasticism. Uh, you know, we don't like that term. Now, uh, as far as its leading figures and uh, those sorts of things, you know, you hit on a lot of it. Johann Gerhardt is the one of, one of the arch theologians of the Lutheran Church and probably the arch theologian of the Age of Orthodoxy. Then uh, he wrote his big uh, Lochi uh, Theologia series, uh, which covers all these commonplaces, theological commonplaces. Uh, we got the idea from Philip Melanchthon writing during Luther's time. Uh, so, you know, anything by Gerhard as far as his academic stuff is great. The thing about Gerhard's load sheet that I really like is it's got a jam-packed full of information, but it also always has practical takeaways as well. If you want to uh, get into something else, though, I would highly recommend uh, Gerhard's Sacred Meditations or... Scola Pietatis. Uh, you can get both of these from Repristination Press. Just Google Repristination Press and uh, go to their Facebook page. Uh, go to repristinationpress.com. Uh, but they are really uh, the leading confessional Lutheran publishing house when it comes to specifically Age of Orthodoxy stuff. They're good, accessible translations. Uh, you know, anybody who says, well, the Age of Orthodoxy was just dead uh, and just purely scholastic and academic, uh, you know, you need to read Sacred Meditations or Scola Pietatis by Gerhardt, and that'll demolish any of those sorts of things. Uh, you know, if you're looking for something more on, uh, or something else, I should say, not more on, uh, but something else about the Christian life, I would also recommend reading anything by Aegidius Hunius, uh, especially, uh, we got this one, The Christian Table of Duties from 1588. You know, the Table of Duties in the Small Catechism is probably the most neglected and dust binned part of the Catechism, and uh, uh, Hunius's sermons on that section of the catechism, the scriptures that those uh, table of duties are taken from are awesome. So check that out. If you want to get into more of the theological side of things, uh, I would highly recommend also then uh, Egidius' son, Nicholas Hunius, and Balthazar Meissner in two books against the papacy. We've recommended this recently. It just came out by Repristination. It's great. You should get it. It's great. Uh, good solid Lutheran polemics as far as dealing with Rome. Uh, and then two, while we're talking about good solid theology and Aegidius Hunius, uh, if you're interested in the stuff that's going on, uh, what the synods are teaching about uh, objective justification and whatnot, I would pick up Aegidius Hunius' uh, theses opposed to Huberianism or uh, this Greenwood, a clear explanation of the controversy among the Wittenberg theologians concerning regeneration and election, which is a good read and a mouthful of a title. Uh, but here, Hunius takes aim against the idea, uh, both the faulty predestination views, uh, but also the faulty idea that there is an objective justification 
of the entire world then. So I'd recommend those. Um, and of course, there are lots of others, but uh, that's a good starting place uh, for dealing with Age of Orthodoxy. The best way at this point, since you've read an introductory work about it, is to read the guys themselves. Check out Repristination Press. Like I said, uh, they just they just kill it when it comes to Age of Orthodoxy stuff. So check them out. Thanks for the question. Thanks for giving us an opportunity to talk about the Age of Orthodoxy. If you got a question about this topic or any other, shoot me an email, atpholycross. That's all one word, atpholycross at gmail.com. We'll get to you as soon as we can.